If you've been looking for a newer certified Toyota, come be part of the team. With inventory arriving daily, we'll help you find a vehicle that works for your lifestyle and budget. We'll continue to ensure that your next buying experience is as safe and efficient as possible. Our service center is open with easy online scheduling and a quick clean process to get you back on the road safely. Head to teamtoyota.net and be safe, be strong, be a team. Well, this is the Phillies Talk podcast we've been waiting to do. Uh, He's Jim Salisbury. I'm Corey Seidman. And when we sat down last Thursday, it was just before MLB reached a new collective bargaining agreement, just before the lockout officially ended. And now here we are. It's Monday morning. Jim is down in Clearwater, Florida, watching the Phillies have workouts. He's been down there for a few days. Uh, Jim, this mad dash now to the regular season begins. What's your impression been the first couple of days of Clearwater? Are things is it chaos? Are things under control? I guess Rob Thompson and Joe Girardi, pretty busy guys, trying to organize everything here, huh? Yeah, mad dash is a great way to put it. Uh, controlled chaos is a great way to put it because you know uh, spring training is usually six weeks, and honestly, with the way guys report early, it's probably closer to seven weeks, and uh, everything's condensed now into about twenty-seven or or less uh, days. Um, and really today is going to be your first official workout Sunday. Yesterday was the report date. Guys are getting physicals, uh, getting reacclimated to the clubhouse and should be, um, pretty close to a full squad workout, uh, later today, Monday, um, afternoon, the minor leaguers are here. So this place is full of baseball players and, um, already, uh, Monday morning, you know, a lot of activity. Uh, early work, individual work um, on the half field, and of course, uh, bullpen sessions are up and running. The familiar pop of the mitt. Um, just before I came up here to chat with you, Kyle Gibson and Sam Coonrod were on the bullpen mound throwing to JT Realmuto, who looks great. I didn't really have a chance to talk to Realmuto other than, um, you know, hey, how you doing? Uh, but uh, he looks good, he looks strong. And Logan O'Hoppy is also a young prospect catching a bullpen. And um, he's quite the physical presence. Anyway, baseball is back. Um, one of the big things I'm looking for today uh, in the next hour or so uh, before the first regular workout will be if Zach Wheeler indeed gets on a bullpen mound. He said yesterday that he uh, would or hoped to, and that will begin his ramp up toward the first week of the season. The reason I say first week of the season is um, he's pretty much been ruled out for opening day by Dave Dombrowski yesterday. Had uh, a little shoulder soreness in December, had to kind of, you know, back off his program. So he's a little bit behind. Says he feels really good. He was out, you know, on flat ground yesterday, popping it pretty good, looked free and easy. Um, But, you know, it's a long season. And, you know, under ordinary circumstances, a guy that leads the National League or leads the majors in innings and, finishes second in the Cy Young race would be your opening day starter, but uh, sounds like they're going to push him back. Uh, but he believes he can be ready, you know, in that first, somewhere in that, you know, day, probably three, four, five, six, seven of the season. And uh, with the condensed spring training, you're going to see starters, you know, probably not, you know, going maybe 100, 110 pitches right out of the gate. Um, they'll be, you know, reeling in the uh, pulling in the reins a little bit on their starting pitchers. It might be more like the equivalent of your final spring training start, that first start of uh, of the season when you start, you know, inching toward a hundred. Um, so, you know, Suarez, Ranger Suarez is going to be behind because of visa issue. Wheel is going to be a little bit behind, uh, but you know, at this moment, until and until you see guys on the on the mound doing it in spring training, you're, you're always curious of. Until you see them looking like them all, their old self, you're always curious what's going to happen. But it looks like uh, they're just going to be behind a little bit, and, um, and, and that should be okay. I mean, it's a long season. If you have to just trim back on the first start or two, that's fine, um, as long as you can get 30-plus out of them over the long haul. So that's kind of where we are here uh, on day one. And um, also, I mean, big topic, Odubel Herrera is coming back. Um, they have big opening in left field, big opening in center field, so they're going to um, kind of fill the center field spot status quo with Odubel Herrera. Matt Ver- Verling, a rookie, is going to um, get a look as part of a platoon with uh, with Herrera. So Herrera's come back more like a part-time player. But if somebody emerges and grabs that job, I think they'll 
they'll ride that guy. Moniak, Hazley still um, with the club, you know, will be in the mix, though, um, you know, maybe not right out of the gate. They're going to really have to earn it. So uh, with a roadmap in center field now, all focus is on left field. And, um, you know, I still expect them to probably do something significant out there. And Dave Dombrowski has a history of being very aggressive in free agency and in trade. So I think you need to kind of keep your eyes on, on both areas, free agency and trades. And I apologize, Corey. I've opened up this podcast with one of my typical <laughs> long-winded um, responses. Uh, take it away, my friend. No, so there's a couple of things there I just want to follow up on. First off, I want to give all you listeners out there just a heads up that throughout spring training and then leading into the regular season, we're going to be doing daily Phillies Talk podcasts. Uh, sometimes it'll just be one of us. Sometimes it'll be both of us. Sometimes there'll be a guest, try to get you some sound, whether it's you know talking to guys pregame or you know, if something jumps out post game, so just be on the lookout for that Phillies Talk Daily podcast. Going to start it off this week, actually. Try to provide some updates from Clearwater throughout the week. Uh, Jim, I want to start with Zach Wheeler. You know, obviously, very, very important Philly. Maybe their second most important player um, yeah. after Bryce Harper. And I would agree. and and like he said, he's feeling okay now. And that he thinks he could be back, you know, the first week of the season. But it's always a red flag when a guy who throws 215 innings uh, experiences shoulder discomfort during an offseason that, you know, sets him back somewhat. Uh, we've heard pitchers over the years downplay injuries. You know, guys, baseball players are kind of wired that way to not not say things are a big deal. And, uh, you know, if it comes to that bridge, then, it, you know, you cross that bridge when you get there. But how worried are you initially about the Zach Wheeler injury? You know, it's something you have to keep your eye on. I mean, you summed it up pretty good. Anytime you feel soreness, it, it, it's a red flag. And, um, you know, he says it dissipated quickly and it's out of there now and he is feeling fine. But like I said, until you see a guy on a mound looking like himself, uh, you always have that that little question mark. Um he did make a big jump from 60-something innings to over 200 last year. Um, and he carried a heavy load. I don't know what that noise is. There, it sounds like big. Do you hear that? It's just the ambiance, right, down in Clearwater? Yeah. Someone it's, working not the, on a, it's not the crack of the bat. It's, oh, it's, you know, I don't know what that is, but uh, somebody banging something. So, um, yeah, until you see him kind of looking like your old self, yeah, it's always in the back of your mind. Um, uh, but, you know, for what we have right now, you know, he doesn't seem too worried about. It. He's like he's like I said. He's supposed to throw a bullpen here. Uh, take a peek at him if he doesn't throw it. I mean, maybe you know. I mean, you know, who knows? But I, I totally agree with you in that. You know, he's one of the two most important Phillies. So, I mean, he's. You know, you can say is he no importance number one, number two, th number three. I mean, who cares? He, he's he's indispensable. He is absolutely indispensable. He is he is a number one. He's a he's an ace. He's a horse. Uh, and, and you have you know, built your starting pitching staff around him. Uh, you need him healthy, being that ace, being that horse, taking that ball every fifth day, giving you, uh, pit, taking you deep into games, giving the bullpen a rest, giving your team a great chance to win, just everything he's done here for two years. So if in this next month we don't see him on the mound looking like himself, yeah, you're going to be more and more worried because um, – you know, so many things have to go right for this team if it's going to contend. And I still think the starting rotation has the chance to be the strength of your team. And if Zach Wheeler's not Zach Wheeler, that's a big setback for your team. So, yeah, it's it's an unexpected storyline for us to keep keep a look at and keep uh, track of throughout spring training with a number of other storylines. Yeah, and just a reminder why you can't waste the kinds of seasons that Bryce Harper and Zach Wheeler had last year, because you never know if that's going to be the most durable or the most healthy or the most effective season of one of those guys' careers. Yeah. Uh, Jim, before we move on to center field, I wanted to ask about Zach Eflin. It seems like the news on Zach Eflin was the opposite, that maybe there is promise for him to be ready earlier than expected. Yes. And this was something I heard back as early as November that he was making great strides uh, uh, in his recovery from knee surgery. Uh, he had that, you know, he's got that kind of chronic at this point, patella tendonitis. He's had it since he was a kid. And a number of years ago, he had it addressed surgically, both knees. He had it addressed uh, in September in his, uh, was it his right knee, his push knee. But he's feeling good. He's been, he's already thrown bullpens. So that's where Wheeler is behind. He has not been up on a bullpen mound yet. Typically, these guys come into camp having thrown a couple bullpens. Uh, so Wheel is just getting on a bullpen mount here today. That puts him a little bit behind. But, you know, Eflin has thrown some bullpens. 
He is ahead of schedule. Um, I always thought that if, if you had Zach Wheeler, uh, I'm sorry, Zach Eflin by like mid, mid May, even approaching, you know, Memorial Day, that 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 would be a good thing, uh, because you know, I just don't believe in rushing guys. I believe in having them strong and and, and getting them and before you really turn them loose. But uh, the word is now he could be ready that opening week. Um, again, we'll have to see how it progresses here throughout the month. Uh, but that's that's a real bonus for him because it's his free agent year. He wants to get out there and and uh, get after it and stay healthy. And he could be looking at some uh, a really nice free agent score in the offseason. He has a big season, and it's big for the team because, like we said, I mean, Wheeler and Suarez uh, are a tad behind. So it's good to hear somebody's a, a tad ahead. But they'll they will not let him go unless he's you know absolutely a hundred percent. But um, right now it looks all sy- systems go. For, for Zach Eflin, and that's, like I said, good for the team, good for him. Okay, topic three, Odubel Herrera. That's really been what, I mean, most of the city has been talking about the last 24 hours from a baseball perspective. Uh, I'll say that personally I'm shocked that the Phillies are circling back and, um, you know, considering this reunion with Herrera, uh, after all they'd been through both, you know, off the field and on the field, his performance was, you know, okay at best, but certainly not resembling the kind that got him that contract with the Phillies in the first place. Uh, it speaks to the thinness of the center field market. There's really not much out there to sign. Chris Bryant can play the position, but is not really a center fielder. Uh, in trades, you have some young guys who are going to cost a ton because of their cost control and their skill level. But still, uh, the Herrera thing caught a lot of people by surprise. Did it catch you by surprise, Jim? Oh, sure. Yeah, because, you know, we all know the history there, um, the off-field history. And, you know, they went through basically, you know, two years of uh, – of you know difficulties with this thing and um you know a year ago they they took a lot of heat for uh giving him a shot and then he goes out there and he wins the job and um you know they got through the season he was okay on the field he wasn't great but wasn't terrible either um and you know it looked like he had rehabilitated himself and 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 you know made good on his second chance which you know i mean you do root for people to uh, become better people and it seemed like you know he made strides in that area and um it seemed like they had their clean break in october november they they bought out his contract paid him the 2.5 million and it seemed like you know they got through it they got through the challenge and they got through uh they survived it and you know shake hands and move on your and get on get on everybody get on their way um and and i fully expected that to be the way it, it was going to happen and i thought that was the way it should happen i thought you know that it was time to make a break and and do something different um, just for a lot of reasons. And um, so, yeah, I was shocked when I heard it was in play and it was serious um, and um, it's come to pass. I mean, the re- reasons why, I mean, I think in a perfect world that everybody would have loved to have moved on from the situation. Uh, it just speaks that, you know, in the last handful of years, they've drafted two center fielders in the, in the top 10 in Moniak and Hazley, and neither one have really panned out. A um, couple, the, several top-notch center fielders probably could be had in trades. Um, uh, and, you know, Reynolds and, and um, Mullins and uh, Kiermaier. And, and, you know, the prices are expensive uh, in, in what you have to give up to get them. And then the free agent market is not uh, overwhelming. Uh, and, you know, Brian is only really a part-time center fielder. And I just haven't got the feel that he's a priority item for them. So they, they exhausted all those avenues, and, you know, so Herrera comes back, and um, because nothing else has really emerged, they'll try to plug that in a uh, – see if, if a platoon works. And if it doesn't work, I expect it to be an area that they continue to address as the season goes on. But, you know, with sort of center field, at least in pencil, uh, maybe not a Sharpie, but, you know, permanent Sharpie, but at least in a pencil checked off, they can focus on – uh, on their knees in uh, in left field, and I still think they could do something significant out there. Uh, there are big free agent names available, and um, I also think David Dombrowski is an aggressive guy could could maybe make a trade. So we'll we'll see what happens. Um, but you know, PR wise, they're going to take heat for bringing back O'Double, just like they took heat for bringing him back last year. It's like you know, it's like you know, same time next year, and uh, we're we're back at it. 
Um, but, you know, I didn't sense it to be, uh, you know, a major issue last year, as long as uh, Odubel is, is a good citizen. And uh, if he plays well, hey, let's face it, this is why they're bringing him back because they need a center fielder and they're in the business of winning ball games and they think he can help them win, in ball, win ball games. And if he does help them win ball games and he plays well, um, all the other rumble will, will quiet down. It will. Um, just like, you know, a million years ago when the J.D. Drew drama was brewing and everybody said you can't bring J.D. Drew to town after all this. I always said the minute he hits one in, in the second deck at Veteran Stadium, it's going to be all better. And I'm not, you know, not comparing the two situations, anything beyond that, because um, one of them is uh, much more serious. But um, Odubel, they, they've been through it last year. He's been through it last year. And I do think it, it will uh, calm down. And um, eventually, I think he can help it all calm down by putting the focus on his play and by being a good citizen. And if he plays well, helps him win ball games. Uh, It'll at least become, for some people, uh, a little easier to deal with. We'll see. This was not a good year to need a center fielder. Uh, there were only, at the start of the offseason, there were only five free agent center fielders who had even one win above replacement last season. Starling Marte, Chris Taylor, who both signed prior to the lockout. Then there was Brett Gardner, Kevin Pillar, and Odubel Herrera. After that, you're looking at you know, the remaining guys are probably minor league deals. You know, mm-hmm. Delino DeShields Jr., Billy Hamilton, uh, Roman Quinn. There was a report that he signed a minor league deal with the Marlins. So those were some of the alternatives the Phillies had. Uh, Jim, the Phillies also made an addition in the bullpen. Uh, what was it? Late on Sunday night, Juris Familia, who spent his entire career in the National League East, all 10 seasons with the Mets, did spend two months with the Oakland A's in 2018 when he was uh, dealt at the deadline to Oakland. It was one of those rare situations where a team traded a guy and then was able to re-sign him that offseason. There's always a the talk like, oh, try to you know sell a rental now and be able to re-sign him in free agency. That's what the Mets did with Familia. He comes over to the Phillies, still throws in the high 90s. The recent track record, not so hot. Uh, the price tag, $6 million, seemed a little bit much. What did you think of this signing? Yeah, the price tag seemed a little high, especially when Ottavino went off the board, uh, what, for $4 million, was it, Corey? Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of... If you watch and listen to Dombrowski, he likes hard throwers, uh, and it kind of fits with some of his his likes. Uh, last year, if, if you watched what he did, he brought in Coonrod, a you know, triple-digit guy who with command issues, Alvarado, a triple-digit guy with control issues. I would even take it beyond command. And uh, Familia, uh, close to triple-digit guy, big power, high-octane arm, who's had some trouble throwing strikes at times, and – uh, walks have been high, um, but, you know, there's experience there. And uh, if he throws strikes, I think he can help them in, in a setup role. Um, Corey Knable's, you know, lining up to be your closer. And, uh, you know, the bullpen's an annual issue here. Issue here. They have thunder out there in, in Coonrod and Knable and Alvarado and, and um, uh, Familia. They just got to go through. They got to throw strikes. They got to get ahead and counts and throw strikes. So that's the big issue. We saw how effective last year Alvarado could be. Um, but we also saw how ineffective he could be when he didn't throw strikes. And he, he gives you a lot of agita. Uh, but there's great relief when he when he rolls the ground ball or gets a strikeout. So um, a lot of similar types down there, hard throwers who with command and control issues. I think was we uh, I think um, Familia and uh, Alvarado were both very high on the um, – walks per nine last year so that's something to watch but um you know we'll see certainly like i said a lot of thunder down there yeah walks have definitely been an issue for familiar the last three seasons also allowed a career high 10 home runs a season ago uh, the philly stuff still have would, would seem to be a lot more work to do in the bullpen honestly i mean you look at this this uh bullpen the way it's currently constructed you have knabel who slots in as probably the closer then you have familia jose alvarado potentially the setup men I'll stop right there. Jose Alvarado is the top lefty in your bullpen. I'm not sure that can work. I think we kind of saw that movie last year, didn't we? I mean, he. there are times when he's awesome and he can get you out of a bind, but there are also times when he walks the bases loaded and can't throw a strike. Uh, and right now, you look at the Phillies 
you know, the, the, the makeup of that bullpen, the two lefties probably would be Alvarado and maybe a Bailey Falter or a Ryan Sheriff, who was a waiver claim back in November. Still mm-hmm. seems like they need some veteran left-handed experience. And I still think he's out there looking for, for, for more bullpen help. And I think there will be guys out there. Um, but I mean, you're right. And in terms of just dependability, uh, these hard throwers who don't throw enough strikes, they become adventures. Um, the gosh, the stuff is there, but the pitchability, not to use an old school word, uh, it is not. But on those nights when it all comes together, it's special, you know, when there is command with the power, the power sink, uh, it, it can be it can be special it's just hard to depend on it so um you just need these guys need to put it together and um and 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 throw strikes but i I, his i think his eyes are open uh dombrowski and sam fold and they'll keep they'll keep tinkering they have to keep tinkering they have to get to the postseason they have to get to the postseason it's been a decade um you got an extra team getting in there this year in the national league and the american league and and they, they have to get there Last year you had the MVP and the runner-up in the, in the Cy Young. You didn't get there. Man, that stings. That stings. Those type of years don't happen every year. Uh, and they might have gotten there if they had a better bullpen. So, um, you know, it's like two years in a row they've been knocked out of the playoffs by a – I was almost going to say suspect bullpen. That would be like a compliment. Um, so it's got to be better this year. And if it's not out of the gate, you've got to keep tinkering until you find, uh, find the right mix. They need Connor Brogdon to click. Yeah, I mean, the stuff is good. Last year was great experience for him. Rookie pitched in some um, pitched some big situations. Um, the stuff is really good. It's power, uh, and it's got that really, really good changeup. So, there's no better teacher in this game than experience, uh, than getting out there in a big league mound and, and, and you know learning when you get out of a jam and, and, and some nights getting your butt kicked and getting your nose bloodied and, and bouncing back. And, you know, he went through that. So I think he'll be better this year. He needs to be a, he needs to be a good, really good difference maker. And, and, you know, they need a, a consistent setup man to step up and replace what Hector was down the stretch or in the second half last year. I know he had his ups and downs here, but man, he filled a couple of big valuable roles over the year. When he was good. He was very good. Uh, it's just that when he was bad, he was, he was pretty bad too. <laughs> Like the little girl with the curl, um, you know. <laughs> so they'll miss uh, Hector too, and uh, bullpen. You know, big, big, big question mark. Because yeah, I think the offense will be okay. Um, I think they're going to get somebody in left field that's going to produce some runs. I really do. I think they have to. And um, you know, left side of the infield is a question mark. But uh, I'm looking forward to see how it all all plays out. But the bullpen, like you said, is a big mystery and. Now with Suarez and Wheeler, like you well, don't know, so, that's like uh, the one area where you felt good about. Now there's a little bit of mystery there too. So it's baseball. It's crazy. Yeah, I was going to ask. So with with Suarez, you know, the visa issues probably arriving later, and then Wheeler might not be ready for opening day. And there's you know still a chance Eflin's not ready to go early in the season. Do you think the Phillies are out there exploring starting pitching options as well? I mean, especially because you look at the early season schedule. All those off days they had in the initial version of the schedule in April are gone. I mean, it's like every day once they get started. I think they have one off day in the, over the first two weeks. They're going to be ex- able to expand a little bit, I think, the roster, and I think that'll be in the bullpen. I think they'll ex- at, at first, just because of the shortened, because of the lockout and the shortened um, season, etc. So I'm just trying to look out who's out here throwing right now. Hmm. Um. But I think Dave's out there looking. I think GMs are always looking for starting pitching depth. I think uh, always you have to do that and be stunned if he's not. Um, and But you make a good point with the frequency of games, uh, you know, having that pitching depth. Whether it's shorter innings out of the gate, which we see a lot in, in major leagues now in starting pitching and picking up excess in the bullpen or, or whatever, um, they're going to have to take – uh, you know, do something there. And it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if they continue to bring in pitchers here. Yeah. So to be exact, the Phillies have one off day between April 8th season opener and May 1st, that only off day is April 21st. So a lot of games in a short amount of time there. Uh, Jim, one of the last things I'll hit you on before we get out of here, you mentioned left field. We've talked a ton about all the big names out there, Schwarber, Conforto, 
uh, Nick Castellanos, Chris Bryant. The luxury tax has gone up from two hundred ten million to two hundred thirty million. Do you think that that makes the Phillies any more of a player for the top guys like Castellanos or a Bryant? I know Dave Dombrowski reiterated yesterday, the preference is not to give up a draft pick. Yeah, he talked about that uh, on Sunday. We wrote about that on the website. Um, and, um, you know, with the, with, they've had a history of spending to the tax, like a lot of teams, uh, kind of right up to it. And um, it, with a $20 million increase on the threshold, yeah, I mean, common, knowledge, common sense tells you um, – that they, they have the ability to be more aggressive. And I think, you know, with them not going big ticket, big ticket item in center field, they can be very aggressive out of left field um, uh, to bring in, in somebody that can, do, you know, knock in some runs. And a guy like Schwarber I think would be a good fit. I think, I think you could even lead him off. You know, who knows what, what's going to happen there on occasion. And um, he's got that close relationship with the uh, new hitting coach, Kevin Long. I still think he's a guy to watch, but – Prices are high. Um, these guys are in demand. But if they wanted to be more aggressive, they could be because the tax went up and they have a history of spending right to the tax. And I don't know where Odubel's number is, but you know, I don't. They already paid him a two and a half million dollar buyout last year, so that's kind of it's on the books. I, I could see like maybe four million, even less, probably. Um, we'll see where that. I don't know where the number is at the moment, um, but they can probably do something aggressive in, in, in left field and, you know, even beyond, maybe bring in more arms. Uh, you know, we'll see. And another thing as camp gets underway is, you know, the, the, the infield, left side of the infield. I mean, it's going to be a competition, they say, at shortstop, Gregorius and Stott. I still think Gregorius is going to come in here with a chip on his shoulder and, 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 and play well enough to win that job. But if he doesn't, you know um, – it'll be time to put their money where their mouth is. They're going to go with the rookie at shortstop because I expect Stott will probably have come in here uh, ready to win a job as well. And, and Alec Baum at third base, I I feel like he could be in play if, if they made a big trade. He could maybe – I feel like they have some untouchables in the minor leagues and like Abel and Painter and this Griff McGarry, uh, kind of an electric arm right-hander, and they really like Johan Rojas, but – Maybe a guy like Bohm could be in play in, in the right deal. Um, or maybe he's here and he has a big bounce back season. So, you know, it's it's all out in front of us. We're going to find out. All right. Well, that's the story down in Clearwater. And then just to recap, uh, around the division, some of the Phillies' rivals are getting better. The Mets keep adding. They made a trade for Chris Bassett, solid number three starter from the Oakland Athletics. Uh, slots into the middle of that rotation. The Mets also added at Adam Adovino, as Jim referenced, then the Nationals agreed to a deal with designated hitter Nelson Cruz, who was a much better protector for Juan Soto than anybody that Washington had in the second half last year when teams just pitched around Soto. So division quickly getting better here. That's going to do it for this Phillies talk. As I mentioned, we will be back throughout the week, just in daily pods, taking the temperature of what's going on down at Philly spring training. So thanks a lot for listening. We'll catch you later in the week.